Et donc, je voudrais vous présenter les, 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 les invités d'aujourd'hui. Donc, on a euh, Joren Manart. Je vais éviter de dire chaque fois professeur, machin, etc., etc., parce que sinon, on ne s'en sort plus. Donc, Joren Manart, qui est euh, à l'université d'Augsbourg et qui est un grand spécialiste de la physique des matériaux. Euh, Wolfgang Ketterle, qui est au MIT, au Massachusetts Institute of Technology, et qui est un grand spécialiste de la physique des atomes froids, donc il va parler de ça un petit peu, vous allez sans doute lui poser des questions, qui est prix Nobel de physique en 2001. Et Rainer Blatt, qui est euh, professeur à l'université d'Innsbruck, en Autriche, et qui est spécialiste de ce qu'on appelle les ordinateurs quantiques. Alors, moi, je suis juste là pour faire un peu la soudure. Et en fait, c'est vous qui allez mener le débat. Moi, je vais m'arrêter de parler assez rapidement. Parce que le but du jeu, c'est que vous, vous posiez des questions euh, aux invités, que vous discutiez avec eux et euh, que le dialogue s'établisse directement. Alors, on va peut-être faire une petite pause et d'abord demander est-ce qu'il y a des gens qui ont déjà des questions euh, qu'ils aimeraient... Euh, est-ce que vous avez déjà des questions ou des choses que vous aimeriez demander euh, à ces conférenciers je laisse un peu de temps pour la traduction simultanée, hein, de français à français, donc comme ça, ça, ça va, c'est bon, tout le monde a compris la question Parfait. Bon. Alors, comme en général, au début, c'est toujours un petit, peu, un petit peu lent à démarrer, moi, j'ai une question pour vous. Euh, vous êtes venu écouter ou discuter de mécanique quantique, est-ce que vous savez ce que le mot, les noms, les mécanique quantique veulent dire Est-ce qu'il y a des gens qui savent Oui. Alors, je ne sais pas, ce n'est pas à moi peut-être que vous allez poser la question, mais on va se tourner vers les invités et donc, euh, voilà, on va démarrer. Donc, est-ce que, est est que la mécanique quantique, c'est ce qui a à voir avec le tout petit Oui, well, experts, so <laughs> okay. we should be able to address that. So well, to say it simply for me, quantum physics is a new understanding of nature which emerged about 100 years ago when people realized that the notion of just bodies and particles moving with a definite position, a definite velocity is incomplete. That there are, that this is only an approximation to the true nature of particles. And the true description or the more complete description of nature has to be different. It has to involve quantization, which means that certain quantities like energy cannot be continuously changed, but only in discrete steps. That's where the word quantum comes from. And also that matter has intrinsically a wave character, the character of quantum waves. Maybe just, I can add a few things if you like. Uh, quantum mechanics, as the words say, has just two words, quantum and mechanics. So first of all, we have to talk about what is a quantum. A quantum is, of course, something, as Wolfgang just alluded to, that cannot be subdivided in smaller parts. So quantum of the electricity is what we know as the electron. A quantum of Our air here is the individual air molecule, could be uh, oxygen, could be nitrogen. A quantity that cannot be subdivided of energy would be the least amount of energy that we can live with. This is what we call nowadays a photon, and so on. And when we deal with quantum physics, then we deal with the mechanical, the dynamical behavior of these small particles, essentially and how they interact and how they really yeah, work, how they function in the world. And why is that different from what we know in every day's world? Now, the reason for that is simply the following. In every day's world, you have a huge amount of particles. So if you look at me, you see me because you see lots of photons are scattered by the light here. You see an image of us and that's it. And I'm not going to change, of course, because you're watching me, I hope at least. But uh, suppose you had, say, a, sing a world which consists of a single atom only and a single photon. That's a world which is poor, it's just a single particle and a single quantum of energy. Now, if that single photon gets 
absorbed by the photon, by the atom, sorry, then that atom eats up the photon, it gets a bit more energy, it's higher energetic, but the photon is gone. Your world has changed, your system has changed. And so whenever we encounter a change by the pure, by the pure, pure, uh, by the, by the pure observation of the system, then we have the world of quantum physics. If that's not the case, then we usually, the grain of salt, we usually can talk of classical physics. This is a rough discrimination. Je fais une petite pause pour introduire le quatrième orateur du Colloque Wright, qui est David Gross, qui est le directeur de l'Institut de physique théorique de Santa Barbara, qui est également prix Nobel de physique, et qui va participer à la discussion. So, David, I will speak in French for the students, so you have the uh, simultaneous translation. And now we continue. So, ah, Johan, you wanted um, to say something. I'd like to chip in and give one um, example, um, which is, I think, rather illustrative for the quantum behavior. If something is rotating in our world, say you have a spinning top, the toy, you can, in our daily life, just accelerate it continuously. So the rotation speed just goes up, gets faster and faster and faster continuously. In the quantum world, it is such, f for example, for an electron or for an atom, um, that the speed, the rotation speed, can only up in go up in certain steps, in quantized steps. So you try to accelerate it, you push, it stays at the same speed. You push more, and suddenly the speed jumps up. And it goes at a higher speed. And then you push more, it stays at this higher speed, and suddenly goes up to even higher speed. So the speed makes, the rotation speed makes steps, and the height of the steps is given by a quantum. And in the real world, if in our world, if, if, if you, in the macroscopic world, if you change the speed of a, a toy or of this, this bottle, it actually also goes up in very tiny little steps, but they are the steps of the size corresponding to the steps which you saw in, in, in rotating the atoms. And because this is a large object, you don't realize them. So it, it gives a continuous impression, but in fact, it's also going up in, in finite, very little steps. Vous avez compris tout ce qu'il a dit ah, On va revenir là-dessus. J'ai juste une remarque, avant qu'on passe à votre question, j'ai juste une remarque pratique euh, au niveau du, du, du son, du, du niveau de, de son ambiant. Si vous n'utilisez pas les casques de traduction, euh, euh, soyez sûr qu'ils sont coupés, parce que sinon on entend euh, les traducteurs comme ça, ça fait un bruit de fond, et du coup euh, ça, ça génère un peu des, des interférences. Alors ça c'est un terme bizarre, on va revenir là-dessus aussi. Vous aviez une question euh, Allez-y. Peut-on seulement définir la physique quantique comme la physique moléculaire So can one define quantum physics as molecular physics? Well, I would say no. Molecular physics is a subset of quantum physics. Molecular physics means that matter has an atomistic structure, that matter is not continuously distributed, but comes in atom, 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 or molecule, molecule. But in, in some older days, people thought that matter consists of atoms, but used a classical description for atoms. So quantum physics is more. Quantum physics, and I hope we can talk more about it today, includes that an atom, because we need a wave description, we need a quantum description, can be at two places at the same time. So it's more than an atomistic or molecular description of the world. Allez-y, hein, lâchez-vous. Hein. Pas... Ils ont l'air comme ça terrifiants, mais ils mordent pas. Hein. C est, c est... Non. Oui. 
comment ça se fait que l'électron il tourne autour du noyau mais enfin, sans savoir où il va un peu c'est un peu indécis sa trajectoire comment comment ça se fait see so the the notion of having an electron rotating about the nucleus is a very classical picture that we all learn in school because we are so familiar with the planetary system, the sun and the planets uh, surrounding it. But this is not exactly what we really come up with in quantum mechanics. What we learned in the early, the 19th, in the early 20th century is the following, that an electron actually behaves like a wave. And uh, when you just take this seriously, then the electron really is uh, located around the, the center of the nucleus. It really is not orbiting. It's sort of, we call it stationary. It is just there. And uh, we, when we try to figure out where the electron really is, we find it with a certain probability, sometimes here, sometimes there, sometimes there. And there's a whole space filled, what we call, with a certain probability of finding that electron. You will find and in school, you, the, the chemists talk about orbitals. But orbitals has nothing to do with an orbit, that's where it comes from, but it just gives you the likelihood of finding the electron in that particular space. So this wavy behavior is rather the picture that we have instead of the trajectory or the orbit that you really may infer from the classical picture. So the electron is really sort of a distributed particle around the nucleus, not orbiting. And if you just assu uh, assume that picture, then uh, you get a different feeling of how these things are. And then, of course, you have to invoke wave mechanics and the laws of quantum mechanics to, to measure these things. Then this is perfectly stable. I mean, sorry, yeah. just to show the random nature of quantum mechanics. We have now the last speaker who has appeared spontaneously due yes. to quantum fluctuation. By teleportation. Teleportation. From, uh, from the cafeteria. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's the quantum <laughs> teleportation. And it's Alain Aspe who is joining us. Sorry, I will give you the floor. Well, maybe let me uh, say the question is excellent. And it can be answered at different levels. And uh, if you try to explain, let's first put it this way, we who have spent years of studying quantum physics, we know the exact answer. We can describe what an electron does in an atom mathematically with all details, and we can predict the behavior uh, in all aspects. But now, we, you, you, are, you are asking a question which is an excellent question. It's a common sense question. And, the, and for us, it raises the question, how should we address it? So one very simple way, and I know some of my colleagues may not like it, would be that assume there is not just one electron. Assume there are many, many electrons or like many, many bees, and the bees are flying around. If you have many, many bees, they're flying around, they can form a cloud, and all you see is a cloud of bees. But still, they can rotate, but you don't see any trajectory. You only see a continuous distribution of bees. So there is still rotation in it. You know when you put your hand into the bees, they are pushing against your hand. You feel the momentum, you feel the angular momentum. So in that sense, to have a stationary distribution, which is just a delocalized cloud of bees, to use the quantum language, is something you can imagine in purely classical terms. The quantum character comes that an electron can be in many places simultaneously. It can have many trajectories, so that one electron can do what a million bees would do. This is quantum physics, the ability of an electron to be in a superposition state of many, many trajectories. So this is a, a good place maybe to tell you about um, the superposition principle. The fact that in quantum mechanics, if we have an allowed state we have an allowed state of an electron, 
simplest example being an electron spinning with its spin axis up, and we have another one spinning with its spin axis down, another allowed state of an electron. We can add those two states and have a, what we call a superposition, which is also an allowed quantum state of an electron. Now, in the case of an electron circulating the nucleus, it can be confusing because we tend to describe it as a quantized motion similar to that of the Earth circulating the sun. But there is a profound new thing in quantum mechanics is that whereas the Earth can circulate the sun in any orbit this way or this way, there's no sense in which you can add those orbits. You'd get something, <coughs> wouldn't. But in quantum mechanics, you can add those states. In fact, you can add all of the states which describe an electron circulating in any plane around the nucleus. And when you do that, you get a state which is lower energy. You get the lowest stable orbit of an electron around the nucleus. That's why the state, the lowest state, say of hydrogen, of an electron circulating the nucleus is symmetric, spherically symmetric. It's like a shell with equal probability to be in this orbit or this orbit or this orbit or any orbit, circular orbit. That superposition of orbits you can't do in classical mechanics. The Earth is in one orbit, picking out a specific axis. Quantum mechanics, the lowest state is symmetrical and, in a sense, is the sum of all possible orbits. There's only one electron, and it's described by the sum of all possible orbits, which kind of looks like a cloud. Il n'y a que qui parle, hein, c'est pas juste. <laughs> so some, some colleagues of us actually have real fun doing experiments in this direction. And they actually work with millions of electrons which form one giant wave. And they make small loops of conductors and these electrons form an electric current which you can measure in microamps or milliamps, so really a big current which flows around this loop. Um, for example, in one direction, which corresponds to one spinning direction of a, a planet around the sun, this current flows like this, but in the experiment it is allowed that the very same electrons the very same current given by the electrons flows at the very same time, at the very instant, in the opposite direction. So the current which is flowing consists of a superposition of these two currents, so each one with a milliamp flowing in this direction and flowing in this direction. That's how nature is behaving at the very, very same time. And only in the instant, at the moment, where you say, now I'd like to know it, and I'd like to measure in which direction the current flows. So you go in and you measure the magnetic field, or you m measure the amps which are going. And then the current decides, oh, OK, and now I go this way and not the other way around anymore. This is really peculiar, really curious. Oui, je, je peux parler français si ça déstabilise pas les, la traduction, les, les écouteurs, etc. Non, oui, non, ils ont l'air oui. très stable, je les ça vois. Ça va bon. euh, Oui, je, je crois qu'il faut absolument insister, comme, comme David l'a fait, euh, sans doute les collègues auparavant, sur le fait que la notion de probabilité quantique appliquée à un seul objet est vraiment extrêmement bizarre et radicalement différente de la notion de probabilité classique. Si vous avez un seul objet en physique classique et que vous dites cet objet a 50% de chance de se trouver ici et 50% de chance de se trouver là, par exemple, je prends une pièce de monnaie, 
et bien que je sois moins, un moins bon prestidigitateur que, que Thierry, je, je fais ça et à la fin, je vous présente mes deux mains. Il y a 50% de chances que ce soit à droite, 50% de chances que ce soit à gauche. Et tant qu'on n'aura pas ouvert les mains, on restera toujours avec les 50%. Et au moment où je vais ouvrir la main, on va s'apercevoir que c'était ici, peut-être une autre fois, ce sera de l'autre côté. Mais vous n'avez aucun doute sur le fait que même avant que j'ai ouvert la main, en fait, la pièce était d'un côté. D'accord Et la notion de probabilité va s'introduire par le fait que si je recommence 100 fois l'expérience, en faisant au hasard entre mes mains, eh bien, dans à peu près 50% des cas, ce sera d'un côté, à peu près 50% des cas, ce sera de l'autre, mais dès l'instant où j'ai fini de secouer, où j'ai fermé mes mains, c'est soit ici, soit là. Alors que les probabilités quantiques, quand vous avez un objet unique et que vous dites « il est soit ici, soit là », en réalité, il est à la fois des deux côtés. Et ce n'est qu'au moment où vous allez ouvrir les mains pour observer que vous constaterez qu'il est soit d'un côté, soit de l'autre. Alors vous allez me dire, qu'est-ce que c'est que cette histoire Comment vous savez qu'il était à la fois des deux côtés Puisque quand vous avez ouvert les mains, vous avez bien vu qu'il était d'un côté. Eh bien la réponse est la suivante. C'est que si sans ouvrir les mains, je rejoins mes deux mains et que je fais une nouvelle opération... Si c'était des photons ou des particules, on appellerait ça les recombiner sur une lame semi-réfléchissante. Si je fais une nouvelle opération, je vais m'apercevoir que le résultat que j'obtiens à la fin dépend bien du fait qu'il était des deux côtés à la fois. Alors, je vais vous raconter ça maintenant, non pas avec une pièce de monnaie, mais avec un photon ou avec un électron. Vous, avez, vous savez tous ce qu'est une lame semi-réfléchissante. Une lame semi-réfléchissante, vous prenez un faisceau de lumière, un faisceau laser, vous l'envoyez sur un, sur un morceau de verre, il y a une partie qui réfléchit, une partie qui est transmise. Tout le monde a vu ça, vous avez vu un rayon lumineux être partiellement réfléchi, partiellement transmis. Vous prenez un électron unique ou un photon unique et vous faites la même expérience. Vous l'envoyez sur une lame semi-réfléchissante. Et vous dites, il a 50% de chance d'être réfléchi, 50% de chance d'être transmis. Vous mettez deux détecteurs et vous constatez que c'est détecté soit d'un côté, soit de l'autre, pas des deux côtés à la fois, comme les pièces dans mes mains. Mais si maintenant, au lieu de mettre des détecteurs, vous recombinez, vous avez envoyé votre photon, ça s'est séparé en deux, le ça étant je ne sais pas quoi. Vous recombinez le ça sur une deuxième lame semi-réfléchissante. Et là, vous avez observé un phénomène d'interférence qui prouve que le photon est passé des deux côtés à la fois. Parce que si je change quelque chose d'un côté ou si je change quelque chose de l'autre, ça va modifier la figure d'interférence que j'ai à l'arrivée. Donc ça prouve bien que lorsque j'étais dans cet état intermédiaire où le photon était soit d'un côté, soit de l'autre, en réalité, il était quand même des deux côtés à la fois, bien qu'il y en ait un seul. Donc je vous dis ça pour vous faire comprendre que les probabilités quantiques sont d'une nature radicalement différente des probabilités classiques. C'est ce que disait David quand il disait que, au fond, l'électron, quand il est autour du noyau, il est à la fois dans une orbite comme ça, et dans une orbite comme ça, et dans une orbite comme ça. Le « à la fois » est à comprendre aussi de cette façon probabilité quantique. Vous savez, ça vous suggère des questions ou vous avez d'autres choses que vous voudriez savoir sur ce sujet Ça vous laisse sans voix. Hein non, vous avez une question Allez-y. Il y, a, il y a un micro là, qui va arriver, ça sera plus facile. pour. Vous dites donc qu'un photon peut être à plusieurs endroits à la fois, mais est-ce que les deux demi-photons sont, restent liés C'est-à-dire, est-ce que si on change la propriété du photon, les deux moitiés euh, changent euh, Ils ne restent pas liés au sens... Si, si je fais quelque chose sur ce photon ici, euh, en fait, il ne faut pas parler du photon ici. Il faut, ici, on est au cœur de la dualité en deux particules. Au moment où ça a été séparé en deux, 
il faut penser en termes d'ondes. Vous avez entendu parler de la dualité de particules. Donc, euh, euh, la lumière est à la fois une onde et une particule, surtout si je considère euh, un photon unique, de la même façon qu'un électron est à la fois une onde et une particule. Donc, parlons d'un électron. Il a été séparé en deux. Donc, il faut penser à l'onde qui a été séparée en deux. Si j'agis sur cette onde ici, ça ne fait rien à l'onde qui est de l'autre côté. Et c'est précisément parce que si j'agis d'une certaine façon sur la première onde et si j'agis d'une façon différente sur la seconde onde, que lorsque je vais recombiner les deux ondes, je vais voir qu'il y a un effet de ce que j'ai fait et d'un côté et de l'autre, ce qui prouve bien que c'est passé des deux côtés à la fois. Donc voilà ce que je peux vous répondre. Cela dit, pour que les choses ne soient pas trop simples et pour vous embrouiller un petit peu, il y a quand même un cas où, d'une certaine façon, on peut dire, alors tous mes collègues ne vont pas être d'accord, d'une certaine façon où on peut dire que ce que l'on fait d'un côté affecte ce qui se passe de l'autre, c'est si je mets un détecteur ici et que je détecte que le photon est ici ou que l'électron est ici, alors il est certain qu'un détecteur placé de l'autre côté ne détectera plus rien. Donc d'une certaine façon, c'est un peu ce qu'on appelle parfois la non-localité quantique, d'une certaine façon, vous avez fait quelque chose d'un côté et apparemment ça a influencé ce qui se passait de l'autre côté, mais vice-versa. Vous pouvez dire que c'est le fait que vous avez mis un détecteur de l'autre côté qui a influencé le premier côté. Mais voilà, donc j'ai rajouté la deuxième chose pour bien vous faire comprendre que la physique quantique, c'est toujours plus subtil que ce qu'on croyait. C'est-à-dire quand on croit avoir compris quelque chose... D'un seul coup, on s'aperçoit qu'il y a encore une étape plus subtile dans le raisonnement. Je crois que David veut rajouter quelque chose. Ou, ou il va être en désaccord avec moi, je suis sûr. <rire> C'est la dualité quantique. Non, non. Uh, the, the interesting thing about quantum mechanics is that we all agree in the sense that if we are given an experiment uh, set up that one of my experimenter friends sets up, we all agree on how to describe it to calculate and to make predictions. We disagree on how we talk about it. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to clear up one thing that might be confusing in Alain's um, answer to you, which is these waves. You might have the impression that these are like water waves, that you take a, a, a moving hunk of water and you split it into two moving hunks of water. And in the, sense, the same sense, you take an electron or a photon and split it in half, an electron on one side, half on the other side. That's not the case. These are not waves in ordinary space. You, there's no such thing, in this context at least, of half an electron. Any experiment in which you put a detector on one side or the other, you will detect either no electrons or one electron, no photons or one photon. Quanta, electrons, photons are indivisible. These are waves in a different space, and they describe, if you want, together the state of the system. And the amplitudes of the waves describe or tell you what the probabilities of observing one electron or no electrons on either side are. But in no sense are you really splitting the electron into one little piece of charge which has half a unit of electric charge and half a unit on the other side, or a photon. You are simply <laughs> constructing a state, a complete state, uh, which, in which the amplitudes of the waves on either side in a, not in real space, but in different space that descri describes the nature of nature, tells you what the probabilities are of observing an electron or a photon on either side. <coughs> Because that whole th description is correlated, different parts of it are correlated, what you detect on one side gives you, 
immediately information about the other side, even though it is far enough away that you cannot have gotten that information by the propagation of light. Some people refer to this as non-locality, spooky, weird non-locality of quantum mechanics. That by itself is not spooky. I'll show you in a, a classical case of such spookiness. If I take off one of my socks and give it to Johan, and <laughs> I give the other sock to Thierry, yeah. and I tell them, my socks are either red or blue. And they go now to the end of the galaxy. And Thierry opens the box, and he sees that he has a red sock. He immediately knows that Jochum's, the sock in Jochum's box is red opposite sides of the galaxy. There's no way he could have told him. If he could have told him, then Yom could have made a bet with Wolfgang. I bet you that my sock is red. And he would have made money. But that can't happen. So that kind of correlation exists in classical physics as well. Is it strange? No, because we understand how that happened. There's a very good hidden variable theory that explains that correlation. What is strange about quantum mechanics is that one cannot construct such a hidden variable theory for the kind of correlations that exist in quantum mechanics. Correlations are no big deal. But the nature of the quantum correlations that exist in quantum mechanics cannot be explained by such a hidden variable theory unless you have such propagation of information, which isn't allowed by relativistic theory, which has a finite propagation of information, the speed of light at most. <coughs> and I'm sure Alain will de describe in his lecture, and I won't steal his thunder, the weird correlations that quantum mechanics predicts that can never be explained by such classical correlations like two socks of the same color. Well, I have nothing to add. I fully agree with what you have just said just now. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Johan, you wanted to add something? Maybe? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking how to put it. So, um, <laughs> I have a slightly different view. And, and to me, things are a little bit spooky indeed. There is, an, in, in, to me, in, in quantum physics, um, things which are, are really curious and also concerning these waves. For example, um, David Gross mentioned the fact that an electron can rotate at the very same time in this direction and in this direction, this superposition thing. What we can do, for example, and which has been done experimentally, is the following. One um, fabricates by say, uh, uh, an atom or a nucleus which decays. That, that's just possible. Two electrons which just go into different directions in space. So one electron goes in this direction, the other electron goes in this direction. And we know that definitely the rotation direction of both electrons are opposite. That's just, in this case, a law given by nature. Okay? Now, what is happening if you do a standard experiment? The electron which goes to the right can rotate, of course, in this direction and in this direction, and also the other one. Both rotate in both directions. So both are in a superposition of these states and um, maybe win a little bit of energy due to that. Okay? So this this guy goes in both super goes in a superposition in this direction and this in, in this direction, and that can be measured. One can measure that this electron is in a superposition. Now, what happens if you measure the electron, which went for five minutes in this way, and you say, "Now I'd like to see in which direction it rotates." You'll see, oh, this rotates in this way. 
And because you know that both have to rotate in the opposite way, at the sa very same instant, the electron on that side leaves the superposition and decides to rotate in the other way. So, to me, this is a little bit spooky. Unless you explain a little more, it's just like the socks. Tomorrow, tomorrow night, I will <laughs> explain that more. <laughs> Anna will probably the socks, before you give. do the experiment, open up the box, I are in either red or blue, and you don't know. When you open up one box, you know what the other one is, and it is. Yeah, there's complete correlation, and and there is a close relation to what we were saying previously that the that quantum probabilities are different from classical probability. Where I, I told you, uh, with a quantum object, before you open the hands, uh, you uh, you have to accept the idea that it was simultaneously on both sides, and. As uh, you say, before you open the boxes for the socks, before you open the box, uh, you, you cannot think that they are both red or both uh, green or whatever. Your, 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 your choice, I mean, or blue. Uh, uh, the, the, this exactly that idea of the difference. Classical probabilities refer to things that we think are. We don't know what they are, but we think that they are. It's called reality. Quantum mechanically, you cannot say that it is one thing or it is the other one until the moment when you will observe it. Well, yeah, so I, I think you will detail it much more in your lecture on on, on Thursday. Yes, sir. So maybe we'll, you ask we'll, me that. We'll so end I will up, do it. We'll end up <laughs> this particular topic with Wolfgang wanted to say something. I yeah, think he wanted to add something. Well, I wanted. Okay, let me first add something. Uh, I have some, I usually react uh, uh, in a negative way. I don't like when physicists say quantum mechanics is mysterious. There are famous quotes from famous physicists saying nobody understands quantum mechanics. This really sounds unscientific to me because we all understand it to the extent that we can do years of research in the laboratory and explain everything we see with the formalism of quantum physics. The question is just, what is understanding? I'm an experimentalist. I want to study matter. I want to find new forms of matter, and I want to understand them. And for me, understanding is that I can quantitatively almost exactly describe what nature does. And if I can, even before I turn on the experiment in the laboratory, I'm sometimes able to write down in great detail what will happen. And I call that understanding. So that's a very important statement to make. And in that sense, we know what we are doing. There's a scientific method. We make predictions. And the outcome either confirms validates the theory or refutes the theory. But then there is a second level, and this is when we try to put quantum mechanics, explain it in common language, or make models like the socks. Or we want to talk about waves. We talk about an electron which, so to speak, is split. It's split that it can be in two places, but it's not really split. So then there is some confusion. And uh, what happens is, as a scientist, I'm fully understanding what the equations mean. I understand in mathematical, with mathematical precision what is going on. And I know exactly that Sometimes I can describe what electrons doing with red and blue socks, and I have no problem with that. Or another time, I can describe the wave-like propagation of electrons like water waves. Water waves and electron waves often have exactly the same mathematical description. 
But the moment you change an experiment, the water waves are no longer capturing everything what the electron does. Then we need the socks. Then we need the, the electron, which is split into two pieces. Also, it's not really split. It's just in two places at the same time. And it can be get terribly confusing if you take each of those explanations too literal. The socks take you to some point, but if you want to be quantitative and make a model that quantum mechanics is just, you know, many, many colored socks, you get into deep, deep trouble. And that is something we are, we are familiar with as scientists. We know that we can explain something with an analogy, but we also know where the analogy is insufficient. But it is at this point that people, especially lay people, get confused and think it's mysterious. For me, there is no mystery. It's well understood. As you can see, it's... Uh, uh, pardon, je reparle en français. Comme vous voyez, c'est un, un sujet qui, 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 qui n'est pas épuisé. Avant de, de continuer, parce que Alain et David voulaient rajouter quelque chose, mais moi, je voudrais d'abord vous demander à vous, est-ce que vous avez d'autres questions ou est-ce qu'il y a des choses qu'ils ont dites que vous voudriez voir précisées euh, Ou est-ce qu'on les laisse continuer à discuter Non Oui Alors, Alain d'abord et puis ensuite David Oui, et... Il y a vraiment une chose que je voudrais préciser à propos de ce que vient de dire Wolfgang. Vous êtes jeune, vous avez des perspectives qui s'ouvrent devant vous. Je voudrais... Je... C'est très important. Ce que je vais dire, ce que je vais dire, c'est très important et je pense que Wolfgang va être d'accord avec moi. Euh, quand Wolfgang dit « je comprends par les équations », je suis d'accord avec lui dans un certain sens. N'en tirez pas la conclusion que nous avons tout compris. Ceci est autre chose. Wolfgang passe son temps à explorer des phénomènes que nous n'avons pas encore découverts ou que nous n'avons pas encore compris. Ce qu'il veut dire par « je comprends », il dit « j'ai les outils qui vont me permettre de comprendre ». Mais la nature est beaucoup plus riche que ce que nous avons déjà exploré. Ne croyez pas que les physiciens ont fait le tour de tous les phénomènes qui existent. Au contraire, chaque fois que nous progressons dans notre compréhension de quelque chose, en général, comme nos idées sont de plus en plus claires, nous arrivons à formuler des questions que nous n'arrivions même pas à formuler auparavant. Donc ne vous trompez pas. Lorsque Wolfgang dit « je comprends avec les équations », et que tous autour de cette table, nous sommes d'accord avec cette affirmation, ça ne veut pas dire que la physique est terminée et qu'on a tout compris. Ça veut dire qu'on est d'accord sur les outils et les méthodes que nous utilisons pour comprendre, mais plus nous avançons, plus nous découvrons que le monde est subtil. Alors il y a un deuxième point sur lequel je veux euh, insister. C'est que si quand même on insiste pour avoir des images, comme dit Wolfgang, et que on constate que Parfois, on pense à des ondes, parfois, on pense à des particules, et on se rend bien compte que ces images sont mutuellement incohérentes. Alors du coup, on revient aux équations, et là, avec des équations, tout va bien. Mais quand même, ma pratique, mon expérience, c'est que quand les images deviennent incohérentes, c'est là que ça devient intéressant, c'est là qu'on a les phénomènes quantiques purs. Tant que vous pouvez vous faire une représentation claire et logique des phénomènes, il est probable qu'on n'est pas encore au cœur de la physique quantique. On sera au cœur de la physique quantique quand précisément on va avoir des équations dont la réponse est claire, mais en revanche les images sont bizarres et on est gêné avec les images. Ça c'est une bonne indication que sûrement on est en train de s'intéresser à un phénomène intéressant. You wanted to add Uh, well, I certainly um, agree with a land that we haven't discovered um, all the secrets of nature. Okay. And um, I doubt, however, that they're going to be discovered in the realm that you're uh, working in at low energies. The mysteries of nature uh, that are beyond our theoretical comprehension usually lie at incredibly short, shorter distances than those that we comprehend or more intense um, phenomena that have not yet been explored. 
And there are many such areas of physics which uh, we suspect our current theoretical framework is inadequate to describe. But quantum mechanics is a very unusual phenomenon in the history of physics. It, it was, a hundred years ago, an enormous conceptual revolution. Uh, even more so than relativity, which was another conceptual revolution, which more or less we are all very comfortable with. And it... I'm not sure they share your opinion <laughs> in the room. <laughs> the twin paradox is really simple to explain. The, um, and the reason is that we construct as infants a pretty good picture of the world, which is good enough so that we can walk to the table and pick up a toy. That's an incredible mental effort, and it's a classical picture of the world. And then we're, you go to school and you're taught classical mechanics and you're taught electricity and magnetism and thermodynamics and you're taught how to construct a quantitative description of a classical world which agrees with your everyday experience and you learn to think classically and you think that you live in classical Newtonian space and you F equals MA really works and that's it and that's all wrong. And then you go and you take quantum mechanics and you're told all of that is wrong. Quantum mechanics is not just a, a, not a bunch of funny, weird, small effects that you add on to the classical world and then try to describe them in the same classical terms. That's when you run into trouble. In physics, the new theories eat up the old theories. Those theories are gone. They only remain as approximations to the better theory in certain circumstances. The goal of quantum mechanics, so the goal is not to explain quantum effects in terms of classical images or pictures, which we try to do instead of, to, especially to laymen or to people who don't know how to work in Hilbert space. The goal, the goal, the scientific goal, is to try to explain the classical world in terms of quantum mechanics, which is the true theory. Now, even quantum physicists have problems doing that. We haven't completely done that. We're still working on it. Quantum mechanics is only 100 years old. That's a short time for new, profound concepts. We, know, we understand quantum mechanics much better than Heisenberg did or Dirac did or the inventors of quantum mechanics did after a hundred years. But not well enough to be able to reconstruct our classical, our infantile classical world out from quantum mechanics. And if we did, if we were able to truly remain in the quantum world, which we believe is the correct description of everything, our classical images being only approximations, including the interpretive interpretation, so-called, of quantum mechanics, what it means to perform a measurement, and why probabilities emerge from the formalism, which is only partially understood, then we would not have these problems that we still argue and debate. But even we have all gone through life as infants and as school children, being educated and learning science and learning how to think using wrong classical images. I would love to take an infant and educate <laughs> from the beginning to construct a quantum vision of the world. <laughs> but it's hard to find <laughs> how to do. parents willing how to to do. <laughs> <laughs> to do the experiment. Est-ce que vous avez d'autres questions? Oui, vas-y.
So should I translate the question? The question is, okay, quantum mechanics is uh, nice, exciting, and so on and so on, but what are the applications of quantum mechanics? Is it useful for something? Yeah. Maybe I can answer. There, there are many, many applications which you're using today, um, of which are very basically quantum physical, of which you just may not be aware. And there are many, many more to come. So what is it what you're using today, um, which is based on quantum physics? For example, if you're sitting there listening to the headphones using the microphone, the electric signals are amplified by transistors in the electronics. These transistors are everywhere. They are in in these amplifiers, they are in the computers, they are in your iPhone. And, and these transistors just work due to quantum physics. And they have been invented by people knowing about quantum physics. Without quantum physics, this wouldn't work at all. Or another example, um, the lamp here in the back, which is so beautifully red, um, these are LEDs light emitting diodes, um, which make a very nice way uh, to create light. Um, it is very energy efficient and um, it will be used in the future to replace all these light bulbs to save tremendous amount of energy um, in order to uh, prevent creation of greenhouse gases and so on. And the way the, the light is created in these devices, in these diodes, is a pure quantum physical phenomenon. These are electrons traveling in, in these diodes, and these electrons suddenly, in jumps, lose their energy, some of their energy. And by doing so, during this quantum jump, they create a quantum particle of light, a photon, which then makes the light which you see. And depending on the amount of energy the electron loses, the light may be red or maybe green or maybe blue. Another example are lasers. Lasers are beautiful quantum uh, mechanical, quantum physical phenomena. They are pure quantum physics. And lasers are used for so many applications, it, it's unbelievable. Your CD player wouldn't work. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, or also many devices in medicine, um, for example, MRI machine, if, if you go there and, and the doctor looks into your body, um, this is um, just distilled quantum physics. Without quantum physics, these this devices wouldn't work. Um, I tried to figure out actually devices or parts of, of our economy today which are not based or not using at least an indirect way quantum physics and it's very hard to, to figure out anything. I think I, I would bet, I didn't find the number on the web, but that more than 90% of the world economy 30, is... 30%. What, 30%. Let, let, let me finish the, the sentence. That more than 90% of, of the world economy is either directly based, this is your 32%, or indirectly based yes. on quantum physics. So without quantum physics, we wouldn't have our economy today. And these are things which were invented 100 years ago in a very arcane uh, manner by people who didn't think at all about applications. Je voudrais insister sur un point dans ce que vient de dire Jochen. Il la, la mécanique quantique permet de comprendre pratiquement tous les phénomènes que nous avons. Mais il a dit plus que ça. Il y a une différence entre comprendre. Par exemple, la mécanique quantique nous a permis de comprendre pourquoi la matière est stable. Avant l'invention de la mécanique quantique, on ne pouvait pas comprendre que la matière faite de charges positives et négatives qui s'attirent soit stable. Je le redis, des charges positives et négatives qui s'attirent Normalement, tout devrait s'effondrer sur soi-même. La matière ne s'effondre pas. Il a fallu la mécanique quantique pour comprendre qu'elle ne s'effondre pas. Mais ça nous a permis de comprendre quelque chose qui existait déjà. La matière stable existait avant qu'on la comprenne. Ce que nous a dit Joran, c'est autre chose. C'est que les transistors n'existent pas naturellement dans la nature. Il a fallu que les meilleurs physiciens des années 1940 essayant de comprendre 
la façon dont le courant électrique se déplace dans certains matériaux qu'on appelle, enfin, se, se, se propage dans certains matériaux qu'on appelle les semi-conducteurs, c'était les meilleurs physiciens du monde qui, essayant d'appliquer ces concepts quantiques à la compréhension de ça, soudainement se sont dit « Mais si je prends du silicium très pur, que j'ajoute un peu d'impureté, que j'en prends un autre morceau, j'ajoute une autre impureté, peut-être que je vais avoir un nouveau système qui va être un transistor. » Et le transistor et, leur, et les, les microprocesseurs et les mémoires que vous avez dans tous vos appareils électroniques n'ont pas été inventés par un bricoleur de génie dans son garage en prenant des objets qui existaient déjà. C'est la mécanique quantique a permis d'inventer des objets nouveaux qui n'existaient pas. Le laser n'existait pas. Il n'y a pas de laser naturel dans la nature autour de nous. Encore une fois, ce sont les physiciens qui ont réfléchi à la façon dont la lumière est absorbée et émise par la matière en termes quantiques qui soudainement se sont dit « mais peut-être qu'on va arriver à faire une source de lumière nouvelle, genre de lumière que personne n'a jamais vue naturellement ». Ils ont inventé. Donc vous voyez, il y a deux niveaux dans ce qu'a dit Joron. La mécanique quantique, bien sûr, nous, est nécessaire pour comprendre des tas de choses, mais qui existaient déjà. Mais surtout, elle a permis de fabriquer des nouveaux objets auxquels on n'aurait même pas pensé euh, auparavant. Uh, Rainer, you wanted to add something before? Oh. No, I, I, it I was think the it, 30%. Percent. The 30%. Percent. Sim yeah. uh, simply, the 30% percent is goes to the total, internal, uh, total revenue that's made by companies that really is directly based on, on quantum mechanics. So this is a fixed number, and this is a huge sum. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Wolfgang, you wanted to? ...say that the large, a large proportion of modern materials is on the quantum physics, on the quantum understanding of matter. On the other hand, you can be an architect, you can be an engineer, you can construct an airport, a building, you can be a physician and treat patients, you can be the director of a hospital, and you don't need to understand anything about quantum physics. Because all the fruits of quantum physics which you are using come in the form of modern materials. You can prescribe drugs. The drugs were developed by doing quantum simulations of, of chemical reactions. They were developed by the pharmaceutical company which has full-fledged simulations of the quantum behavior of, 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 of chemical bonds. But a physician can simply use them. Or you can use modern building materials. You can use computers with modern hard drives and you don't recognize that what makes the hard drive so small is quantum magnetism, special form of magnetism, uh, tiny little sensors to read out your hard drive, your, to read out your information, which were developed by physicists only because they analyzed quantum physics. Mm -hmm. So we have this amazing separation between quantum physics is everywhere But we don't see that as long as we take the materials for granted. As long as we just switch on an LED and it gives light. Cool. It looks like a light bulb. But it's quantum physics in action. But so therefore you can use, you can mass produce quantum mechanical devices without ever understanding or without ever seeing the quantum behavior behind it. David? Well. Maybe I just uh, just I I hope I hope we've convinced you now that quantum mechanics is important. Um, <laughs> but it's remember what we said before: qu everything is quantum mechanics. The world is quantum mechanical. Uh, it took us a while to understand that because we were interested mostly in big objects. But when you get to the atomic level, of which all matter is made, microscopic matter is made. It's governed by quantum mechanics, and that's when we had to realize that the world is quantum mechanical. So the, may, the fruit is understanding. Now, you, understanding is always good, and, some, and, but, and one of its uses, aside from just enjoying the understanding of the world, is to um, invent new things. Uh, and many of these things were described. The, laser and the chips and uh, 
that required understanding how atoms work. But if you think about it, we're just at the beginning. And uh, if today's economy is um, dominated by the inventions that are made possible in the world, works at the atomic level, uh, that the inventions of tomorrow, which many of which we cannot imagine, are going to be also totally dominated by that. And we're just beginning to use that knowledge and the control it gives us at the level of atoms to understand chemistry, to understand biochemistry, to understand the structure of ordinary materials, and um, to make new materials, to control and direct new chemical reactions and create new chemicals, new molecules, to uh, control the biological world at the scale of individual molecules. The uh, potential is enormous, and it's not as if there's anything else that is the world. And the more we understand about it, the more we can control it, and the more um, we can make marvelous new inventions. Yeah, you want to what you are saying. On, on the globe, on the planet, we have big problems coming up. Energy, clean water, global warming, you name it. All these problems. Resources, do we have enough of, of, of the metals, of the elements around, rare earths, whatever. And these problems are the big problems for the future. And some of these problems may be solved by political means and whatever. But there will be also, of course, an important part coming from technology, from science and technology. And I bet that most of the uh, solutions science can bring to, to, to help resolve this, these problems actually will be based on quantum physics and, and the understanding of, of quantum physics. The question. So, just wondering, um, do you guys think that classical physics is no longer useful to be taught in classrooms to young <laughs> students? <laughs> because I don't know, it sort of seems like that, and I, don't, I have the feeling that we lose quite a few uh, interested <laughs> <laughs> physics students. Well, cla uh, classical uh, physics is a very good approximation. We understand how that approximation arises. It's very interesting to start with the true description of the world, which is quantum mechanical, and then derive the classical mechanics as a very good approximation for you, for example. You're big. Your de Broglie wavelength is very small. You are very, very classical. <laughs> How, uh, and therefore, classical physics is extraordinarily useful as a good approximation to quantum physics. Just as non-relativistic physics is a very, very good approximation for slow-moving objects at low energies, uh, although the true world is relativistic. These approximations are very important. For example, we describe fluids as continuous objects of, ma of mass and velocity and pressure, and uh, but they're actually made of atoms. It's not important to describe how water flows in a channel to use at at the atomic description of water. It's quite a good approximation to approximate it by a continuous fluid. So these approximations are extraordinarily valuable. And I actually, even though I advocated an experiment where I took a human baby and and grew it with a quantum mechanical view from the beginning, I'm not even sure how I would do that. Because our direct experience is of the microscopic world, and the natural picture that we evolve from an infant to Newton is of Newtonian classical physics. And it would be very hard to educate a, a human mind in a purely quantum fashion. 
I think, in fact, uh, it probably my experiment, which has never been performed, wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, and the and the reason I believe this is that I I have s uh, some friends who are famous mathematicians, so they are mathematicians, and when they try to study physics, they don't start as we do when we teach physics at the bottom, and then go up according to the historical route each time, saying the previous description we told you was incomplete or false. Now you've got to learn quantum mechanics. So they start at the top, with, not with, with string theory, and try to learn physics at the very top with quantum field theory, and then maybe understand the lower levels. And they end up knowing the equation, and they end up knowing the formalism pretty well. But they lose the intuition. What's Im so important in physics is not just the equations, but something we call intuition, which we can't really define. Yes. And it is based, I think, on the fact that we learn physics by touching and feeling and doing experiments. And that's very hard to do as a six-month-old baby in the quantum world. <laughs> Wolfgang, you wanted to add something, and then Heine. Yeah, I would say very strongly, I think it is impossible to teach and understand quantum physics without first learning classical physics. Because all the concepts of a mathematical theory, mathematical description, physical laws, concepts like momentum, angular momentum, if I would teach that, in a quantum mechanical way, I don't think any of my students would understand it. You have, or give, let me give you another example. When you want to understand electromagnetic waves, we first teach mechanical waves, we teach water waves, that people understand what wave-like motion is. And once you understand it in a classical sense, we can take our students to the next level and we can talk about electromagnetic waves, which you can't touch, and which you can only indirectly see. And then in the next step, we take our students to quantum waves, which are even more abstract. I don't think there's any other way of learning quantum physics. Yeah, I, could I, not, <clears throat> I could not agree more with what uh, David and uh, Wolfgang just said. But uh, we also have to be aware of the fact that we have no new machines. When you look at the world in a, a different way these days, look at that you look with a microscope, see the microscopic world. We as physicists have a different kind of microscope. We see the quantum world. We see that there is a quantized world there. Of course, this is not available to most of you, but uh, you got raised in the classical picture, which is fine. But we should not forget about these tools. And the more tools we have, and this is why we are here, we want to convey to you the idea, look at this, with our tools that we have, there's wonderful machines available with which we get a new window to see the world with our different eyes. And then, of course, we have to accept, as David said, the world is quantum. Whatever we do, we cannot deny it. And uh, so we better look at these things with those eyes and accept it. And then, of course, form a different worldview. You wanted to add something? Yeah, you know, th this... Uh, has happened before in the history of physics. But one of the great conceptual revolutions of the 19th century was the notion of a field that transmitted force over distances. So uh, you, you shake an electron here, and it causes a disturbance in the electromagnetic field, which then pulls on a positron here. And that was invented by Faraday, a great experimentalist who discovered the laws of electricity and magnetism, and Maxwell, who formulated a mathematical theory. But Maxwell was uncomfortable. All 19th century physicists were uncomfortable with this notion of a electric and magnetic fields that just lived somewhere in space. They tried desperately for years to construct a mechanical model of the field. It was vibrations in something they called the ether. And they 
actually try the English physicists especially tried much more mechanical with levers and no dis, mechanical descriptions of the field the concept of a field and probably if you had asked a bunch of mathematical physicists at the time who believed in fields could you educate someone to believe in a field without this mechanical they would have said impossible <laughs> and um so we're in a similar situation. The notion, our, I, I, I truly believe that our understanding of quantum mechanics is still in its adolescence. And that if you take a course in quantum mechanics, you will learn quantum mechanics better than we did yes. when we took a course. And our students, our grand students, will understand quantum mechanics better than we do. And maybe in 100, 200 years, uh, people will begin to think quantum mechanically at a very early age, uh, using perhaps some of the new tools that visualization um, and you know, uh, give us. I, I think the, the example that David gives of uh, Maxwell and Faraday having a mechanical model actually bring, uh, je vais le dire en français, uh, comme ça il faut donner du travail au traducteur. <laughs> Pour qu'ils gagnent leur vie. <laughs> you, you didn't notice, but they stopped translating in protest. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, oui, c est, c est, ce modèle mécanique que Faraday et Maxwell essayaient de développer euh, au 19e siècle, quand ils commençaient à connaître les équations, dans un certain sens, ça nous ramène à la discussion que nous avions il y a une demi-heure ou, ou une heure à propos du fait que nous sommes d'accord sur les équations de la physique quantique, mais quand on va commencer à avoir des images, on va être en désaccord. Moi, par exemple, j'ai tendance à bien aimer la non-localité en connaissant toutes les limites de la notion de... Mais j'ai tendance à, à bien, bien l'aimer. Mais moi, je revendique le droit, pour les physiciens qui ont besoin d'images, d'avoir des images bricolées, des images aussi bizarres que celles de Maxwell et les autres avec des leviers, etc., parce qu'on a dit quelque chose de très important il y a un moment. Nous avons besoin d'avoir de l'intuition. Nous ne sommes pas simplement des machines à faire des calculs. Nous avons besoin d'imagination et d'intuition pour envisager de nouveaux phénomènes et aller les étudier. Et c'est une affaire personnelle pour chacun d'entre nous de savoir ce qui nous permet de guider notre intuition. Et il est clair que pour Maxwell, c'était sûrement bien d'imaginer ces modèles mécaniques. Ça l'a aidé à progresser. Et, et, et moi, je revendique, pour moi, le fait que la non-localité m'aide, en optique quantique, à inventer des, des nouvelles situations expérimentales. Mais je ne demande pas du tout à mes collègues d'adopter mon point de vue. Chacun bricole son image parce que, comme l'a dit David, nous n'avons pas été élevés dans un monde quantique. Et les seules images dont nous disposons sont des images classiques et dont notre intuition, on est obligé de la bâtir avec des images classiques qui donc sont un peu bizarres, un peu étranges. Et je crois que c'est ça qui fait euh, tout l'intérêt. C'est ce qui fait ce que je vous ai dit tout à l'heure. On est loin d'avoir achevé. La physique n'est pas une science achevée. Est-ce qu'il y a de oui. nouvelles questions David oui. a quelque chose à dire. Ah, David, vous voulez je parle. Uh, the, those models and the ether got Maxwell into deep trouble. <laughs> and uh, it, took, it really took 40 years to truly understand the content of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. It was Einstein who simply said, there's no ether. We don't need an ether. And uh, understood the <laughs> true underlying beauty and symmetry of Maxwell's theory. So, Ma we are all slaves of history and our own personal histories and our cultural history. But if, you know, I, none of us know what the future is, but I suspect, given the, the past and the problems we still encounter in thinking about the meaning interpretation of quantum mechanics, that we're somewhere closer to Maxwell than to Einstein. Est-ce que vous auriez eu... Parle dans le micro, Alain, s'il te plaît. Aurions-nous eu 
Einstein s'il n'y avait pas d'abord eu Maxwell C'est ça la question. Right. So you stay Maxwell, I'll go on to Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good I'm point. Happy, too. I'm happy with Maxwell. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point to pass the mic to someone. Else. Thank you. Um, concerning the experiment happening at CERN with the LHC, do you think that uh, the findings would provide any insightful breakthrough in quantum mechanics? David, I guess. Uh, there's, I, I hope and uh, suspect that there will be breakthroughs. Of course, they will be in quantum mechanics because the world is quantum mechanics. Uh, but, and in fact, in my lecture today, I will discuss a particularly new aspect of nature that some of us uh, speculate on and. Uh, suspect might be um, seen at the LHC, which is, can be described as um, quantum dimensions of space and time. So as I will try to explain tonight, <laughs> the LHC indeed has, a, has the ability to open the door onto a um, a, an area in which we are now beginning to, we're now forced to uh, study, and that is the, uh, the quantum mechanics of space and time itself. Uh, the phenomenon I'll be discussing called supersymmetry, which is we hope to discover at the LHC, is a rather mild version of this. The more extreme versions uh, that we speculate on at even shorter distances or higher energies are, are so far beyond our reach. Um, but, um, but this one aspect of perhaps new dimensions of space, new symmetries of this new space, uh, which are uh, these new dimensions being quantum mechanical in, so, in a sense, um, is one where is one of the primary goals of the, S of the LHC, is to see whether this possibility is or is not there. Of course, there are many other things the LHC will be doing, but that perhaps is the primary uh, hope of uh, a good portion of the speculative community, theorists, in other words. There is a question tout au fond, là. Speaking about classical physics and quantum physics, how is string theory an attempt to connect or, or unify both of them? Uh, it's not an attempt. The world is quantum mechanical. We learned that 100 years ago. Everything is quantum mechanics. And every additional under, uh, understanding of the microscopic, the nuclear, the subnuclear world that we have made, uh, some uh, enormously successful understanding of the subatomic forces, is all based on quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics hasn't failed us anywhere. There's n never been, since the beginning of quantum mechanics, any threat to its validity as a conceptual framework. It is extremely hard to imagine changing it, by the way. Uh, so almost no one exploring the frontiers of, of physics worries about uh, the validity of quantum mechanics. Uh, until we get to, to truly the hardest possible questions, say, Big Bang, the uh, nature of uh, space and time at incredibly small distances. And there, where we, we re reach the limit of the, the applicability of our current theoretical framework, which is quantum mechanical, there are indications that we're going to have to change in a profound way, some of our concepts, as we often had to do in 
physics, but not quantum mechanics as such. However, quantum mechanics being the sort of the basis, the, the basic framework in which we describe the world, uh, if we change our, in a profound way, our notions of space and time, which we might have to, uh, that will affect our quantum mechanical interpretation of the world itself. Quantum mechanics and the dynamical description of the world are heavily intertwined. So string theory, as it's understood, and it's still in a very young stage of de development, is uh, a quantum mechanical theory. In fact, not really that different than our standard relativistic quantum mechanical description of the, uh, the uh, electricity and magnetism or the strong and weak nuclear forces. Uh, it has different aspects, and we've learned more about the framework of quantum relativistic quantum mechanical theories, including gravity, but, um, but it's solidly quantum mechanical, and within that framework, there's been no hint of the need to change any of the basic postulates of quantum mechanics. Vous avez d'autres questions? Vous avez une question? Non? Alors moi, moi je, je voudrais revenir un petit peu sur la puisqu'on avait commencé un peu à parler des applications. Moi, je voudrais vous demander si vous, vous pensez qu'après, finalement, un siècle de, de mécanique quantique, bon, je sais bien qu'ils ont dit qu'il y avait plein de nouvelles applications possibles, mais si vous, vous voyez des nouvelles applications ou peut-être des choses qui sont en train de démarrer en mécanique quantique. Non Alors, on va, poser la, on va leur poser la question. Et si vous aviez à donner des... des des très récentes applications de la mécanique quantique ou peut-être des applications futures mais qui sont juste à la frontière en ce moment, qui n'ont pas été exploitées depuis, on va dire, 50 ans ou 60 ans comme le transistor. Est-ce que vous donneriez quelque chose euh, Qu'est-ce que vous donneriez comme, euh, comme application possible dans, On va dire dans 10 ans, dans, dans 15 ans, quelque chose comme ça. Parce que dans 200 ans, c'est facile, personne ne peut vous contredire. Mais, mais, mais dans 10 ans, 15 ans Everybody's pointing at me. Uh, now, the, what's currently being heavily discussed is the application of quantum mechanical laws to information processing. This uh, subject arose already in the 80s by Feynman, who really thought this is a very exotic idea. But he came up with the, with the following thought. We have very many difficulties calculating quantum mechanical problems properly with classical computers because of all the superpositions and all the intricacies involved that you have to account for, it is very often hard to cast a problem that is uh, written in quantum mechanical terms for a classical computer. And what he said is instead, why not simply use a quantum mechanical system that has all the laws built in essentially and uh, sort of make these calculations? There's different ways in an anal analogous way, but also he thought about doing this already in a fairly digital way, as we used to have computers these days. And uh, that was an exotic idea until about in the mid-90s, a few people came up with ideas. <coughs> Why would that actually be useful? Could it be useful beyond simply speeding up some exotic physics calculations? And uh, so there's a hype that started in 1995 when Peter Shaw from uh, AT&T came up with uh, an ID, idea how to factorize large numbers. Why is this important? important it, it is important because currently all cryptography uh, problems are based on the impossibility to uh, factorize a large number in a certain amount of time. So quantum computation started in 1995, in information processing. Around the same time, actually earlier, based on things Alain did and uh, Nicolas Gisant did here in, 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 in Geneva, the quantum mechanical applications and optics allowed to do quantum cryptography. So these are, of course, then advances that have been made over the last 20 years. You can actually buy a machine doing that. 
using quantum cryptography. So this is already applied. This is not borderline anymore. But uh, then quantum information processing started then in, the in 1995 and people have thought about how to apply these things. Then a little later, another algorithm came up, how to optimize things to, for instance, ask uh, database search. If you use a database, for example, if you want to search a phone book, then, uh, and this is an ordered base, of course, then you know the name and you get the phone number. But if you had a phone number and you want to make a reverse search, if there's no index listing to it, then uh, you would have, in the worst case, to search from A to Z. On the average, you have to search half the numbers of the entries. Grover from Lucent came up with an idea. If you use, say, superpositions that are available in quantum mechanics, then you have to search only the square root of the number of entries. So, for example, if you have a million uh, entries, you would have to search only a thousand times. This is very, very simply put. It's a bit more complicated than that. But essentially, it shows that using the laws of quantum mechanics could actually speed up uh, some computational processes. And this is where all this hype started. Currently, there is a big search how to scale these things up, how to make computers of that. There's applications possible, not this, this is the division in maybe 30, 40, 50 years, but also in order to convey now quantum information in form of quantum cryptography, for instance, when you just want to communicate from one bank to another bank, say a code, because you really don't want to exhibit what's transferred there, then you could use quantum cryptography lines, but then you would have to repeat that over the optical fibers that we use nowadays, quantum information could be uh, transmitted, say, over, say, easily 50 kilometers, stretching it would be 100 kilometers, but then you would have to amplify it. But as you may have heard now, uh, these are superpositions, and if you amplify it, this really means you have to copy it. Copying it really has to measure things, and then you have to transmit it again. But this is precisely not possible, because in quantum uh, information, once you copy, you measure, and measuring then, of course, destroys that information. So you have to come up with a protocol that uh, really transmits that information in different terms. This is a so-called teleportation protocol that we he heard about, which is used in various groups right now. And uh, these little repeaters that you build then are called now quantum repeaters. These are also on the horizon. So this is a future technology that we will have very soon. This is something that comes out of the current research. And then there is more to it. If you use the strange laws of quantum mechanics, so these correlations that we talked about before, you can make, for example, measurements, quantum metrology. You can measure time more precise, more faster. You can measure length more precisely. You can ma make more sensitive measurements, forces, and things like that. There's a number of applications beyond the pure uh, computational uh, speed up that you get because the laws of quantum mechanics allow you to speed things up and to measure things more precisely. And there's lots more to come. One other example is the following. At present, and, and also I think in the next 10 years or so, we'll be developing and advancing quite a bit in um, fabricating machines that allow to build material by manipulating individual atoms so that we take well, all atoms we'd like to have and uh, put them together like building blocks like Lego and build something out of it consisting of a thousand or a hundred thousand of atoms or even more. So precisely controlled that we can say we'd like to have this type of atom at this place and this type of atom at this place. And you can imagine one can build their really funny, outrageous things. In particular, if one takes advantage, exploits, that nature is quantum mechanical, is quantum physical. So that one, in these machines, in, 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 the, in these little well, um, <coughs> parts that one builds up, one actually uses this intriguing effects of quantum physics. And at the same time, as we learn how to build it, and, and we are doing it in part already now, it becomes possible to solve the equations, to do the calculations, how such 
um, parts that are built will actually behave, how their electronic properties, how their optical properties, how their mechanical properties will be. It is very well possible to calculate today with very high precision how an atom or how few atoms behave together, but if it's many of them and if they interact in complex manners, it's just a challenge to the computer power to do it. But one is learning how to, to improve the computers and the software to do it. So I think in 20 years we will have a situation where one actually can predict on the computer, hey, one can make a new fantastic molecule that may help in medicine as a pharmaceutical, um, as, as a medicine, um, to cure some disease. And then one can actually build it um, just by assembling the atoms. Or one can conceive a new electronic device which has... Um, fantastic properties as a detector for something, for example, and then build this device like building it up with Lego blocks by manipulating and assembling individual atoms. So I'm sure that this is something that will come in the next 10 to 20 years. Oh, this is on, on the basis of individual atoms, this is doable today, and, and um, that can be done. But that's not a big help in solving the CO2 problem of the atmosphere, because there are so many atoms out there. So to, to get the CO2 out of the atmosphere, one needs a large-scale process, which is very cheap. And um, to approach this problem by on, on the level of individual atoms would be, I think, an unsuccessful approach. When, when needs to go to, to the, you know, remove thousands of tons of CO2, millions of tons from the atmosphere. So that'll be a different approach, but it, which again will rely on, on quantum physical um, aspects, of course. Yeah. Uh, cette, cette question sur le CO2 me donne l'occasion de dire que ces problèmes d'environnement, de, de, euh, de, de gaz à effet de serre, euh, il faut en parler en utilisant toute la connaissance de la science. Parce que la question que vous posez, de savoir est-ce qu'on peut décomposer euh, la molécule de CO2 en ayant l'oxygène d'un côté et le carbone de l'autre, il ne faut pas oublier les lois de base de la thermodynamique, les lois de conservation d'énergie. Pour faire ça, même si vous avez un processus efficace pour le faire, il faut fournir de l'énergie pour séparer le carbone de l'oxygène. Parce que pourquoi a-t-on du CO2 C'est parce qu'on a fait brûler du charbon pour fabriquer de l'énergie, pour avoir de l'électricité. Mais l'opération inverse va demander de l'énergie. Donc le point que je veux, euh, sur lequel je veux insister ici, c'est qu'il euh, faut apprendre la physique parce qu'on ne peut pas juste régler les problèmes d'environnement par des incantations. Il faut connaître les lois de base. Il n'y a rien à faire. Si vous voulez décomposer le CO2 en carbone et oxygène, il faudra de l'énergie. Cette énergie, vous allez la fabriquer comment donc vous avez simplement repoussé le problème d'un cran. Donc je vous encourage tous, même si vous ne faites pas de la physique quantique, au moins apprenez quelques lois de base de la physique, comme par exemple la conservation de l'énergie. Ça me met en rage chaque fois que dans les journaux, je vois des gens qui proposent des solutions qui clairement violent la loi de conservation de l'énergie. Celle-là, je vous assure, on n'a pas encore trouvé de physiciens qui connaissent de méthodes pour violer la loi de la conservation de l'énergie. Donc résoudre les problèmes, il faut les faire en respectant les faits connus. Ça n'a rien à voir avec la physique quantique, ce que je viens de dire. Mais... <rire> Est-ce que vous avez d'autres questions Ah, il y a une question tout à droite. Parce que on sait que quand la température est proche du zéro absolu, les particules bougent très très, enfin, ne bougent presque pas. Est-ce que c'est possible d'imaginer un état de la matière où les particules ne bougeraient absolument pas If not, um, you, you really have to think of temperature on a logarithmic scale. I mean, the correct 
There's no obvious way of measuring temperature. You might measure instead of temperature the logarithm of temperature. And therefore, zero temperature is minus infinity. No one ever asks, is it possible to get to infinite energy? Because they realize that it would take infinite energy to get to infinite energy. But people ask, is it possible to get to absolute zero? Even though we understand physically that it would take an infinite amount of time to cool to absolute zero, to a state in which all the particles were at least classically at rest. And uh, better to think of te the appropriate scale is one logarithmic scale, where each unit measures a factor of 10, say. And then zero temperature is an infinite distance away. But let me add that I mean, the question was, OK, you can answer it in different layers. Can we go to absolute zero and make matter come to a standstill? I would say the complete an or one answer is it's never possible to go to absolute zero because we have to reduce temperature, let's say divided by 10, an infinite number of time, and we can't reach absolute zero. On the other hand, it depends what material you're interested in. If you freeze water, once water is frozen, you have created H2O, water, in its absolute lowest temperature form. When you, free, when you go further and further down in temperature, at some point it doesn't really matter, going lower in temperature is no longer changing the properties of the materials. And similar, Professor Manhart or my research group, we are studying condensed matter or atomic matter systems where we reach such low temperatures that for all practical purposes the atoms have stopped moving and they already behave. The matter has uh, acquired properties which are already with a very, very high degree of approximation how matter would behave at absolute zero. So in those materials, I would say, I talked yesterday about the Bose-Einstein condensate, I talked about superfluidity. In those materials, it is as if all the motion has been frozen out, and it is matter which behaves, which has the properties which it would have at absolute zero. But there are other materials which there's still some jiggling around, there's still some thermal excitation, and we have to go to picocalvin or femtocalvin, we have to go to even lower temperature to approach the conditions, to approach the properties of matter near absolute zero. There's a fun aspect of your question, because in posing your question, you made an assumption which is based on classical physics. Your question was, is it possible to go down to absolute zero, which, which is not, we have heard, and that everything comes to a perfect standstill. In quantum physics, quantum physics says, even if it was possible, which it is not, to go to absolute zero, things would not be at a perfect standstill, because then you would be able to localize, for example, the electrons precisely at a certain position, which is not allowed. So quantum physics says, even at absolute zero, there's action going on, there's motion going on. Um, and therefore, Professor Kettle was um, so careful in saying, um, you, you can measure the properties of matter as it would behave at absolute zero, but even there, things would not be at a perfect rest. That's also part of quantum physics. Which, in another way, um, also is a property for which I find perplexing too. My colleagues won't. Perfect vacuum is not completely free of energy. It's not possible to get... E Quantum physics says even in vacuum there's a little bit of action going on. You cannot have just perfectly nothing. That, that's very closely related. Are there other questions? Oh, welcome. I just would like to add something because Absolute zero is very close to my heart. <laughs> and uh, and when we talk about 
motion comes to a standstill. And this is something I think I can just tell you in a few sentences. There is motion and there is motion. There is the thermal motion, which is sort of a random motion, but then there is what we call zero-point motion or ground-state motion, which is simply related to the wave nature of particles. Let me describe that. If we take atoms and we go as close to absolute zero as we can, the atoms themselves hardly move at all. We have taken out all the motion. But the electron is still moving around the nucleus. But this is what the electron has to do. This is what the electron has to do to be in the lowest energy state. And zero temperature, absolute zero, means that everything wants to be in the lowest possible state. And for atoms in a big room, the lowest possible energy state is to reduce their velocity to virtually come to a standstill. But for the electron and the proton, they still have to form this, well, we shouldn't take the orbits too literally, as we discussed before, but even in a quantum mechanical way, they still have to move around. But this motion is not random motion. It is the lowest possible quantum state. And this motion always exists, even at absolute zero. So reducing motion means reducing excess motion, reducing random motion, or reducing the motion associated with thermal excitation. But ultimately, yeah, quantum matter has to behave like quantum matter, even at absolute zero. Yeah, there is a question. I don't know if there is a mic close by. Oh, there is one here. Okay, so go ahead and we'll... we'll Comment est-ce possible qu'un qu qu photon soit, soit, soit une, une onde ou soit une particule selon si on l'observe ou pas euh, L'idée que c'est soit un photon, soit une particule suivant qu'on observe ou pas, encore une fois, comme, toutes les, comme chaque fois qu'on essaye d'utiliser des mots classiques ou des images classiques, pour décrire une propriété quantique, on risque euh, une incompréhension. Pendant longtemps, un certain nombre de, des gens qui réfléchissaient au fondement de la mécanique quantique ont utilisé des mots comme cela, c'est-à-dire euh, des mots du genre euh, « finalement, c'est l'appareil de mesure qui détermine le comportement ». Et c'est vrai dans un certain nombre de cas. Mais en fait, la physique quantique est encore plus subtile que ça. Et, et on connaît un certain nombre de cas où on ne peut pas dire que c'est l'appareil de mesure qui fait que parfois ça va ressembler à une onde ou parfois ça va ressembler à une particule. Et donc, je vous mets en garde contre ce genre de questions. D'abord, je ne peux pas y répondre. Et je vous... Je pense qu'il y a 50 ans, quand on, ou peut-être plus, 80 ans, quand les gens parlaient du microscope de Heisenberg, par exemple, qui est quelque chose dont on parlait au début de la physique quantique, on avait cette idée, qui aujourd'hui apparaît un peu naïve, que effectivement l'appareil de mesure va perturber l'objet quantique, et en perturbant l'objet quantique, il va le forcer à se comporter soit comme une onde, soit comme une particule. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on sait que les choses sont plus subtiles que ça et qu'il y a un certain nombre de cas où il n'y a aucune perturbation objective de l'objet. Et pourtant, on est obligé d'accepter qu'il se comporte soit comme une onde, soit comme une particule, alors qu'on n'a rien fait de particulier pour le perturber. Donc euh, voilà, ça fait partie de la difficulté des choses. Encore une fois, on bute sur le fait que chaque fois qu'on veut utiliser des images classiques ou des mots classiques, c'est bien jusqu'à un certain point, mais il faut savoir qu'il ne faut pas le prendre. Encore une fois, je plaide pour l'utilisation de choses comme ça, mais tout en sachant qu'à un certain moment, ça ne va plus marcher. What do you think? Would you agree with that, that a Heisenberg microscope is not the end of the the explanation, right? It's not a mechanical perturbance of the... Yeah, I would say what we have learned is that 
being a wave and being a particle is much, much deeper in the nature of, of all objects. It's not that it comes when we measure it. Yes. It's there all the time. Yes. The dual nature is really how we should imagine nature to be. Il y avait une question là, hein, au milieu. Allez-y. Si l'électron le, le, arrêtait de bouger, qu'est-ce qui se passerait If the electron stopped moving, what would happen It can't. It can't stop moving. It's the destiny of the electron to move because it's a wave, it's a quantum mechanical wave. And in a wave there is no st standstill. Or to say it differently, you think when you are tired, you want to rest, you don't want to move anymore. But the electron which is moving around in a quantum mechanical way, moving around uh, the nucleus, the proton in the hydrogen atom, it would take extra energy, it would take an extra effort to move more slowly. Because a, a wave which moves more slowly is a wave which has a longer wavelength. And if you want to give the electron a longer wavelength and allow the electron to move more slowly, a longer wavelength means it is on average further away from the proton, from the positive charge, and that costs energy. So this is how quantum mechanics work. Motion is the least effort for the electron. It's the lowest energy form, and therefore it never stops moving. Uh, Jochen and then Heiner. So Jochen. It is perfectly agreeing with, with the statements of Professor Kettler. What, what can be done, of course, is to remove an electron away from the nucleus so that you have what we call a free electron, a, an electron that is just move, moving in space and it doesn't feel the presence of any nuclei around. And this electron can at least be in principle and with this problem of um, yeah, almost be stopped. So in a sense, you can have a free electron so lying on the table in front of you, um, but not around the nucleus. There it has to be moving. I just wanted to carry this on a little further. Let's take our single electron right here. This is it. And catch it. And we catch it right here in a cage. We call this a trap. This is possible with magnetic fields or electrical fields or whatever. So let's suppose I can do this. Then you would say, from your point of view, my electron is not moving at all. No, but I have to make a measurement to see whether that's really true or not. What does it mean? I have to precisely determine where is the electron at a particular moment. That's not an easy task, but let's assume we can do that to a certain degree, and then we'll find out that when we make these measurements repeatedly, that we'll find it with a certain uncertainty at, certain, uh, at a certain position right here, and then it, it's within a certain likelihood, a certain probability in an area. Again, we find our concept of prob probability even in the localization of the electron. And the sharper we try to determine where it is localized, the more it's moving, and vice versa. That's what the Heisenberg, essentially, the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship uh, tells us. So even if we catch it, we get an uncertainty in the position, and thus we get an uncertainty in its residual motion. It's sort of uncertain in the position where it is. This is the intrinsic behavior of a wave, and this wave-like behavior that leads to that fact that we inter interpret as the residual motion to which we can localize it. So, David, you wanted to add something? or no, no. Oh, It has been said, so Alain? Peut-être que... Ces questions, savoir si on peut immobiliser un électron, des choses comme ça, reviennent aux questions qui étaient évoquées il y a un petit moment de qu'est-ce qu que ça veut dire refroidir de façon ultime jusqu'au zéro absolu. Et peut-être qu'on peut donner 
un éclairage un petit peu différent qui a déjà été suggéré par quelques réponses. Et d'abord, considérer un seul objet et ensuite nous prendrons un ensemble d'objets, ce qui va nous, nous augmenter la, la subtilité. Si j'ai un seul objet, la vraie question qui se pose, c'est est-ce que j'ai réussi à le mettre dans l'état d'énergie le plus bas possible Et ça, nous savons le faire. C'est-à-dire que, comme euh, Rainer a dit, si j'attrape l'électron dans un piège, les états d'énergie possibles pour l'électron dans un piège sont quantifiés. On a un premier état, un deuxième état, un troisième état. Si on arrive à le mettre dans l'état le plus bas d'énergie, eh bien, euh, en quelque sorte, on a extrait de lui toute l'énergie possible. et On ne peut pas en extraire davantage. Et c'est l'état de repos le plus parfait auquel on puisse penser en physique quantique. Et pourtant, à cause de ce qu'on a dit sur les lois de la physique quantique, euh, il a quand même une certaine, euh, une certaine vitesse résiduelle. En quelque sorte, il est en train de rebondir sur les parois du piège. Mais comme c'est l'état le plus bas possible, c'est en quelque sorte la température la plus basse. Ça, c'est quand j'ai un objet. Maintenant, quand j'ai beaucoup d'objets, il y a une autre notion... Je vais, pas, je vais employer un mot, ça s'appelle l'entropie, euh, qui est en quelque sorte l'idée de désordre. C'est-à-dire j'ai un grand nombre d'objets et l'idée de désordre, c'est que tous ces objets ne sont pas décrits exactement de la même façon. Si j'arrive à contraindre tous ces objets à se comporter exactement de la même façon sur le plan quantique, par exemple, les électrons dans un supraconducteur, comme ce que fait Jürgen Nanart, ou par exemple les atomes que nous avons dans les condensats de Bose-Einstein. Alors s'ils ont tous exactement le même comportement quantique, si nous les décrivons tous par la même fonction d'onde quantique, en pensant au concept d'entropie, nous disons qu'en quelque sorte, c'est comme si c'était le zéro absolu. Parce que c'est l'ordre parfait. L'ordre parfait, c'est le fait qu'ils marchent tous au même pas, comme l'a dit euh, Wolfgang dans sa, dans, sa, dans sa conférence hier soir. Donc ces affaires de, de zéro absolu, euh, de température, etc., comme vous le voyez, euh, ça demande euh, un petit peu de, de raffinement dans la description. Et euh, je pense que c'est important de comprendre que les notions ne sont pas du tout les mêmes suivant qu'on pense à une seule particule ou qu'on pense à un grand ensemble. Merci. Just très bref, parce qu'on va devoir... Just to briefly amplify on what Alain said and, and clear up one confusion. Temperature is a statistical notion. Yes. You cannot define the temperature of a single electron. No such thing. It only applies to many, a system of many components, uh, and, and precisely only when they're in effect an almost infinite number of components. However, uh, temperature is also a measure of individual, in a simple gas, just a measure of um, kinetic energy, of the motion, uh, the average motion of the, of the molecules or atoms. And to be sure, you can stop the motion of a single atom or a single electron, um, partly because it is they, the, le the energy levels are quantized. But when you have many, many objects and the notion of a temperature, then there is a barrier to reducing the temperature to zero. And though for even though the kinetic energy of an individual atom can be reduced to zero, because there are so many more states, so much more entropy, as uh, Alain described, so many more possibilities with just a little bit of energy. And that's why it takes an infinite amount of time for a to reduce the average energy of an infinite amount of atoms to zero. 
Sorry. Merci, David. I think, uh, pardon, je vais repasser en français. Donc, je pense qu'on va faire comme les atomes. On va sortir de notre état fondamental. On va passer à la suite du, du programme. Uh, donc, je vais passer la parole à Jean-Luc Soudan qui va vous expliquer la suite du programme. Essentiellement, vous allez avoir des rafraîchissements où vous allez pouvoir continuer à discuter avec les orateurs. Donc, n'hésitez pas à aller, à aller leur poser la question que vous n'avez pas osé leur poser pendant l'exposé, le, etc. Et puis ensuite, vous allez pouvoir visiter le Physiscope à l'Université de Genève, qui est un endroit où vous allez toucher un peu du doigt, entre guillemets, ces phénomènes quantiques dont, dont on a parlé. Mais avant de faire ça, je crois qu'on va d'abord vous remercier pour toutes vos questions et aussi remercier les cinq orateurs d'y avoir répondu.